Good afternoon. My name is Earthrin Cousin, and I'm a distinguished fellow in the Center on Global Food and Agriculture here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you all, and especially our members, for joining us via Zoom for today's On the Record program. As a reminder, the Council is a nonprofit, independent, and nonpartisan platform. The views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent the institutional positions or views of the council. The Chicago Council on Global Affairs is hosting this conversation today at the end of February to reflect, amplify, and take forward important dialogues beyond Black History Month and to highlight opportunities for structural change and to develop more unity across America. And it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker and my friend, the Honorable Bishop Leah D. Daughtry. Bishop Daughtry is a widely acclaimed organizer, activist, political strategist, author, public and, and theologian uh, who works, who serves, I should say, at the intersection of faith and politics to advance the common good for our community, for our nation, and across the globe. Bishop Daughtry is the co-convener of Power Rising and co-chair of, of the Black Church PAC. She serves as the presiding prelate of the House of the Lord Churches. She is a graduate of Dartmouth College and the Wesley Theological Seminary. Bishop Daughtry, thank you for joining us today for this, what I hope will be a lively and informative conversation. So let's just jump right into it. Since 1976, every U.S. president has designated February, the shortest month of the year, as Black History Month, honoring the achievements of Black Americans and recognizing Black Americans' central role in U.S. history. This year's theme, the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity, explores the African diaspora and the spread of Black families across the United States. So my question to you, my first question to you is how can we amplify the narrative of Black American history beyond the 28 days of February? And will an expansion of this story contribute to better and broader understanding of the role of Black Americans in the shaping of this nation? And if you, uh, if you agree that it will, why is that even important? Well, first of all, thank you, Earthren. It's always good to see you. And I appreciate this invitation to share with you and the members of the council. Uh, and during this last week of Black History Month, 28 days this year, uh, I think leap days, leap years do soon and we get an extra day. Uh, <laughs> You know, Black History Month, I think, is, is one leg of acknowledging the contributions that African Americans have made to this country. Of course, there's also Women's History Month, there's Latino, there's APIA Month. So, you know, th this country we live in is a huge and beautiful tapestry of a lots of different types of people with various backgrounds. And, you know, it's a celebration, really, of what those groups have brought to the American uh, uh, story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a time to really highlight, in particular, their contributions. And so it's always great during Black History Month to talk about the achievements and to talk about, uh, uh, some people call it Black Excellence Month. Mm -hmm. um, because it's about the achievements, it's about the accomplishments, it's about the things that we have contributed to the American fabric. And so it's an important thing for, for Black folks and for Asian folks and for women. And, and But it's important that it's not just for us, it's mm -hmm. for the country to take a pause and celebrate our wonderful tapestry here in America. We are, as we know, 
2000 uh, to, you know, we're, we're this many years into this American experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, and our country was not built uh, with equality in mind. We had some people who came from Europe seeking a better way of life, but soon that turned into what became known as the transatlantic slave trade and the various other episodes in this country's history that have not honored mm -hmm. people who were not of European descent. Uh, that's a stain on our history. It's a stain on our record. And what Black History Month tries to do and the other history months is say, look, America owes a debt of gratitude to Black people, to Asian people, to Latino people. And we have to uh, do something that recognizes the contributions, but that also says we made a mistake that some of the things that are happening even today in 2021 are a result of what happened in 1619 mm -hmm. when we arrived here and through the transatlantic slave trade, through reconstruction, through the civil rights era that created these inequities and inequalities in our system mm -hmm. have really led in many respects. And we see this now. Mm -hmm. To the sense that some people aren't as equal as other people. Mm -hmm. Some people's lives are valued more. Some people's lives are worth more. At least that is the perception. Black History Month helps to say, look, we've all contributed. These are our contributions. These are the people that helped to make America great. And so we want to recognize that. And yeah, I appreciate your historical perspective on the role of African Americans in this country and the honoring of that role. And in an article published in The Atlantic, Wilfred Codrington argued that the United States needs a third reconstruction as an opportunity to address structural racism and to achieve a more equal society. The first reconstruction, as you know, came in the Civil War's aftermath when the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, and you spoke to that. The second reconstruction took place in the mid 20th century with the Civil Rights Movement in 1964. But in 2019, McKinsey Consulting issued a report finding the, a widening racial wealth gap that disadvantages Black families, mm -hmm. individuals, and communities, and, and limits Black citizens' economic power and prospects. So if, if we know that we now have, that the children of middle-class parents only have a 70% chance of remaining in the middle class, then do we need a third reconstruction? And if so, what does that mean? You know, it is a fascinating article. So for your, uh, for the folks in the council, if you haven't read it, you ought to put, pick it up because it's worth, it uh, provides a lot of fodder for discussion. You know, it's an interesting construct. And I, you know, as I've been turning it over in my head when I first read it and when I reread it, is perhaps a third reconstruction is necessary. When you have these kinds of disparities, mm -hmm. Uh, be, between white people and black people, when that you can control for every factor and still African Americans will end up with lesser education, a bigger wealth gap, uh, longer times to buy for home ownership, uh, lower graduation rates, and the only difference is race. Mm -hmm. There's something structural that is wrong and we need to address those systems. It boils down to earth rent for me. It's a moral question. What kind of country do we want to be? Are we comfortable as Americans with structural and systemic uh, problems that keep one segment of our society from achieving their version of the American dream? Is that who we want to be? Or do we want to be a country that lives up to what we say it is, where everyone has an equal chance, an equal opportunity to compete and to succeed. Um, and so this can take the form of, you know, there are, are, are economic challenges, but let's talk about voting rights reform, hmm. uh, which also creates a problem. We've seen that coming through this last election, the differentiations from state to state to state about who can vote, when they can vote, how they can vote, and how the votes are counted lead to the kind of disenfranchisement 
that was fodder for the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And as mm -hmm. that Voting Rights Act has been repealed layer by layer, piece by piece, you have problems with people being able to vote. And if we're a democracy, that's what we say. That's what we try to export around the world, this idea of one person, one vote then why aren't we encouraging people and in building systems that will allow people to vote and for their votes to be counted? Just yesterday, the state of Iowa passed new legislation in their Republican controlled um, Senate that will shorten the amount of time that absentee ballots can, people can vote absentee, that, record, that will stop the Secretary of State of automatically sending out ballots. You will only now get one if you request. If you request it, okay. that your at your vote, uh, your ballot must be in by election day, regardless of when you mailed it. If it doesn't mm -hmm. get there by mm -hmm. noon on election day, mm -hmm. your vote will not be counted. Uh, the polls will close one hour earlier. All of these things are not intended to expand our right to vote but in fact to limit and reduce the, the ability of the people to vote. And when you have every state in the union mm -hmm. restricting, constricting, making it harder, reducing the number of ballot boxes, then we are in fact reducing people's ability to participate in what we like to call a participatory democracy. These things lead to in, unequal uh, uh, roles in government, if, if folk can't get to the ballot, if folk can't vote, if folk can't exercise their franchise, if folk don't know that their ballots are being counted, then why do they participate at all? Which leaves power in some people's hands and power out of other people's hands. So we've got to address the economic issues, voting reform, educational reforms that will really level the playing field so that all Americans can, be, can participate in our democracy equitably and fairly. That's such an amazing uh, <laughs> uh, law that you just noted uh, passed in Iowa, which is in complete conflict with what, as a lawyer, I learned was what we call the mailbox rule. If you go by the postage date uh, or the posted date that the letter was mailed, not when the letter was received, that was that's been settled in this country for quite some time. So to see a legislature pass a law that that is in a direct conflict with legal standards and to know the potential effect that, that can have on people's right to vote is something that we should all be concerned about. But particularly that gets- earthly, earthly, oh, when no, no, you, Particularly when you recognize uh, what has been happening at the Postal Service. So when you couple the, the dismantling of the Postal Service, and we mm -hmm. all have this testimony, mm -hmm. how many packages have we gotten late Mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. the way that the, po the former postmaster general took mm -hmm. out the machine, slowed down the hours, mm -hmm. and so everything. So imagine now that our voting system, our democracy is dependent mm -hmm. on the delivery of the mail Correct. to that a postal right. system which has been, had the guts ripped out of it. So that means thousands and thousands of people will not have their franchise recognized. And we can't call ourselves a democracy if we're going to prevent people from voting. So that gets me right to our, my next question is, what is the role of government and of the federal government in particular in, in, the, in dismantling these types of uh, rules and policies and regulations that can detrimentally impact access to vote or the economic opportunities for African-Americans or people, other people of color in this country? Because on January 26, you will recall that uh, President President Biden delivered a national address on his plans to advance racial justice and equity. Mm -hmm. And he wants to start with an inclusive recovery for all Americans. And he's asked Susan Rice, Ambassador Susan Rice, as in her post as the leader of the Domestic Policy Council, to lead for all of government 
that we will use all of government and begin to review the laws, policies, regulations in the federal government and where the federal government has authority over the state to begin to address some the in, the inequities that are identified and then to dismantle those the the, the policies and procedures where appropriate. Do you think this will work? Is 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 the, does the we we live in in a federalist country, a federalist nation, where there there we have states' rights. Um, so, what is the role of the federal government, and what should we expect from the federal government in supporting the activities that can and to overcome to overcome the challenges that we see being put forth by some of our state governments? You know, I don't know, Earthrin, if it will work, but we have to try. We have to try. Uh, it, my great, great, great grandmother was born in 1789 in what would become Savannah, Georgia. At that point, it wasn't even Savannah. It was just Scriven County. So I descend from a long line of uh, enslaved people. Hmm. And for us, and like black people and Asian people and, and disenfranchised people across America, we look to the federal government mm -hmm. to protect and ensure our rights, mm -hmm. to be the bully pulpit and to be the moral authority that will say, here are the principles upon which America was built. We've had some missteps. We don't always get it right, but here are the founding principles. And the federal government, as the federal government, we're going to enforce those and ensure that every American has the opportunity to live up to the ideals that our country was built on. Mm -hmm. We have to try. And the federal government is the place that can say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to model for the states. We're going mm -hmm. to model for the world mm -hmm. what it looks like mm -hmm. to treat your people fairly, to ensure that everyone is safe and everyone has equal opportunity. America cannot export that to the world if we're not doing it at home. So can it work? I don't know, but we got to try. We got to try like we did in the Civil Rights era when we passed the Voting Rights Act, when we put in place these measures to ensure equity would begin to be part of the conversation. We've tried before, we've succeeded before, we've had some setbacks and we've had some failures, but it, it is part, it must be part of our expectation that our federal government will lead, mm -hmm. that they will take the authority we have vested in them and lead. And look, if it was up to me, and you've heard me, sometimes I like to wave my magic wand. If I were waving <laughs> my magic wand, I would make uh, voting standards a federal thing. Mm -hmm. the, the rules under which you vote should not change if you move. Mm -hmm. We ought to have, as Americans, the same expectation. Me, I'm a Brooklynite. I, sometimes I've lived in Washington. I've lived in Denver. I've lived in Philadelphia. I ought to be able to know that the way that I vote in Denver is the way that I vote in Philadelphia, is the way, and it's federally protected, and the rules are, are the same for everyone and not up to the whim of local elected officials uh, and whatever, you know, force they may be beating that day. Mm -hmm. That would be my magic wand moment is to federalize our voting and make it a national and a federal responsibility to ensure that everyone has the same rights everywhere. Well, I want to get you a, a magic wand. So <laughs> from your mouth to God's ears, but we know that the, 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 the possibility for federalizing uh, the, our voting rights in this country is, 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 is something we hope and work for, but uh, it's, it's challenging to actually achieve. As I told you the, 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 to the audience, as I told you when we began this conversation, we would have a light, uh, an enlightening dialogue with Bishop Daltrey and, and, and she's living up to that expectation. So I ask you if you're interested in joining this conversation to type your questions into CCG dot live and type that into your web browser and ask a question and we will bring those questions into the conversation for response from Bishop Lowry. 
Bishop Arias, we are the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and you talked about the the the, the what is necessary for us as a nation to do to address the challenges that we that that the African American and other communities are 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 living under today. And let's bring this conversation back around and ask a question about if and why addressing these challenges and these inequities is important to America's foreign policy interests. What do you think? I think it goes back to Earth and something I said a few minutes ago. Are we going to lead or not? Do we want to be an example or not? We cannot stick our nose in other countries' business and tell them what to do about human rights, civil rights, women's rights, and equities when we are not dealing with them at home. We can, it's, it's a, you can't ask people to do what you're not willing to do yourself. And so I think that's really the basic bottom line. And, and right now we're in this pandemic mode and we've come out of one administration that was very uh, insular, America first and the rest of y'all do what y'all wanna do. Uh, and now we're in a different space. And so we see under this new administration, America's return to engagement with the world mm -hmm. and even around the vaccine saying that we will help other countries. We will help countries in Africa. We will help countries in Europe because we recognize our interconnectedness uh, and that the vaccine does not have a passport. Mm -hmm. It travels where it will. And so we have to be concerned um, and we have to demonstrate an example to the world of what it means to uh, have human rights and civil rights and equal rights for all of our citizens, if in fact we're going to have any kind of moral authority to insert our nose in Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Africa or Asia or with the Uyghurs, any, if we're not going to take care of business at home and take care of our people at home, we have no right and no authority to get into other people's uh, the way that they manage their citizens and how they deal with their citizenry. And I believe America is a leader and should be a leader. That's the country I want. I want us to be a sterling example, a beacon on the hill. Mm -hmm. And so let's resolve our challenges at home so that we can show other countries who are struggling how to do this. It's not perfect, it's messy, and it's hard, but you, but we can work through it together uh, as a nation. Yes, we know democracy is messy and hard. And we know that a country that has the challenges of the birth defects of racial discrimination that America suffers from is, is one that the, the, those challenges are even exacerbated. But that moral authority, some would say we gained some of it in the election and celebration of the election of the first African-American woman as vice president. And the fact that this government, this Biden administration, administration is the most diverse administration in the history of our country. But many would argue that that's not enough because government alone can't make the changes that are necessary, that we need private sector and civil society. So what role do you see for private sector and civil society in addressing these moral challenges and these ethical issues and the, the, the particularly the issue of systemic racism? You're absolutely right. The government, our federal government, our state governments, our local governments alone cannot fix this because uh, institutions don't run themselves. People do. And injustice wears skin. Injustice wears skin. We walk with, uh, in many parts of our nation, uh, this, this injustice from people who are perpetuating systems, sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly, unwittingly. So I think in civil society, what is incumbent upon corporations, upon businesses, upon uh, educational institutions is to be willing, one, to have the conversation, mm. willing to acknowledge mm. that perhaps in your business, in your school, in your place of, of worship, mm -hmm. that there may be some unconscious bias. There may be a challenge that is preventing all of your members, all of your customers, all of your students from, from doing everything they can do to live up to their potential. As uh, Yana Van Zandt says sometimes, you can't change what you won't acknowledge. Mm -hmm. So acknowledging, I think, for, and being willing to say, let me take a look. 
Mm -hmm. Let me just take a look at my personnel policies. Mm -hmm. Let me take a look at what's happening in my business. Let me take a look about at how we're handling our customers. Mm -hmm. That's one. And then secondly, doing some things affirmatively to address what may be inequities in uh, your systems. I was uh, talking with someone the other day about healthcare inequities mm -hmm. and how our healthcare systems are built. Well, most of our healthcare systems are built uh, to privilege uh, folks who don't have to work during the day so they can take off, they can go and have a doctor's appointment at 11 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Or they have childcare so they can have a doctor's appointment at two in the afternoon. But for working class people, mm -hmm. A system of equity would have doctor's office hours at seven o'clock at night, at eight o'clock at night, hmm. when they are able hmm. to go to the doctor without taking off from work and losing a paycheck, when someone else might be home to watch the children, hmm. that's a system of equity. Is your business functioning in a way that ensures equity for all of your customers, for all of the people who cross your doorstep? We don't have a problem having late hours for shopping. Right, because we know that people need to shop after work. What are the systems in your particular business and civil society that somehow privilege or disadvantage folks because they're working, because of the kind of work that they do, because of the kind of access that they have? They may or may not have public transportation. They may or may not have a car. Those kinds of subtle ways hmm. Hmm. that we leave people out mm -hmm. unintentionally. Yeah, leads yeah. to mm -hmm. creates barriers that prevent people from becoming a full part of the American dream. Yeah. So those are ways that civil society and then make the investments mm -hmm. in your customer base, in your neighborhoods where you do business, in the schools. Are you doing what you can to be a good citizen among the people whom you serve and who help your business to be successful? Mm -hmm. You, you know, when you when you talk about doing the things to equitably, equitably serve your customers, I, I would be remiss if I did not ask you a question about the church, Bishop. Uh, and so, you know, in preparing for this, this, this conversation day, I read an article that was posted by World Relief Organization and, and this summer. And the author recalled the words of Martin Luther King Jr. where he says, the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me. The author went on to say that politics and policy matter, but noting that racial injustice persists because it is reflected in our laws, but law is not where racial injustice begins. Rather, it starts in our souls. And the and, and I and I, I I went further in in because I knew I needed to to, to get to a question that has been bothering many of those who, who, who are part of the church. And that is that churches across our nation remain divided in, in how we even or if they address racial equity or, and racial inequality. And one state conference, and I won't call them out, posted an article during the Summer of Awakening saying nine things a church can do to fight racism. And the first suggestion listed was to hold a Zoom conversation with their members. So I'd ask you, is that the best the church can do? What should, and, and I would speak to not just black churches, but churches with majority, uh, com, majority white congregations as well. And, and what advice do you have for ministers out there who are, who are grappling with these issues and want to do the right things and, and look to, 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 to you with your experiences and your, your uh, thought leadership in this area to provide guidance? guidance? Well, I don't want to ding the Zoom call thing because we're in a pandemic. <laughs> and so maybe that's the way that you can get to your people uh, and say, let's have a conversation about race. Do not come to the church because we're in a pandemic. <laughs> but you get on this Zoom call and let's have a conversation about race. And for many, uh, um, 
church in America is another place where America is divided. Mm -hmm. So in white church, uh, having conversations about race is difficult. Doesn't happen very often. Uh, they don't engage in those kinds of conversations. And for the ones that do engage in politics, okay. they tend to be uh, pretty conservative. And quite honestly, I often wonder what Bible they're reading because they're clearly not reading the same Bible that I'm reading. Hmm. Um, Black church is different. And for those of your uh, uh, listeners, those who are watching us today, if you have the time, I highly recommend that you watch the new Henry Louis Gates documentary called The Black Church, which will help you understand and give you a good, it's not perfect, it's not perfect at all, but it is an excellent uh, primer in the Black Church and what, and it will help you understand why Black Church and White Church is so different in terms of their ethos and standards. So for those who are grappling with this, those people of faith who are trying to navigate their way through this, look, read some books, get smarter, make a commitment to get smarter about this. There are tons of books out there. There's a new one out now by Ibrahim X. Kendi called 400 Voices, uh, 400 Souls is excellent. Hmm. I'm reading it now. And it takes uh, American, African American history in five year chunks, written by some of the most brilliant writers of our time. Help get, make a commitment to get smarter. Make a commitment to acknowledge where you may not understand, where you may have fallen short, and make a commitment to do better. Right. Every day we can do better, and you can start there. Start by doing better. I love it. Great advice. And I'm not dinging Zoom calls because we don't want anyone doing this in person. You're absolutely right. Um, let me, let's turn to our audience because we do have questions. Oh, great. And the first question is, Speaker Pelosi has said that the country needs a strong Republican party, particularly to ensure a healthy democracy. What advice would you give Republicans to make their party more diverse and more inclusive? I agree with Speaker Pelosi. Uh, we do need multiple parties, multiple ideas at the table to let the voters decide uh, the direction that they wanna go. And we don't have that right now. I think what I would say to my Republican friends, and as you know, I worked for Elaine Chow for a while. I, I have many Republican friends and so, um, I, I, I am sincerely saying this, they have to decide to be, to put their country first. What we're seeing now in the Republican party is people who are putting power and party first. Uh, we now have a Senator who would have you almost believe that January 6th never happened. Mm -hmm. It's this gaslight. And I was like, wait, wait, I, I did watch it on television. What is he talking about? If the Republican Party can pivot and decide that it is about country first and that the ideals that they want to advance are important enough for them to stand by them, even if that means that they lose, then they will be on their way to creating a different kind of party. I always say to my Republican friends who are like, why do black people always vote for the Democrats? It's like, you haven't given us a choice. Hmm. You haven't offered us anything to choose from because what you're offering is a throwback to a hundred years ago and all of your people, you just watch them and say, I don't wanna be part of that. If you offered us a choice, a real choice, a real policy difference, mm -hmm. real leadership, you may see something different from people of color who tend to vote for Democrats. Uh, so I'm hopeful that this moment that they have just come through will push leaders to the front who will fight for the soul of their party and who will be willing to advance new styles of leadership and new ideas mm -hmm. so that we all have a choice and can engage in the debate about ideas, not the debate about leadership style. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, a great, great, <clears throat> So advice to, to the leadership of the Republican Party, but some would even suggest that we need multiple parties beyond just these two to be more representative. What's your thought there? 
I'm for that. I think the more choices, the better. Uh, it, I, I don't, you know, listen, I'm a woman with a lot of pairs of shoes because I can't decide and because I like them all. I like choices. So when I pack, my suitcases, oh, as you know, always mm-hmm. over full because I like to have choices. I think the more parties, the better. Mm-hmm. The more, not, not friend wackadoodle parties, but real parties who are offering real ideas in the marketplace of politics is good for America. It's mm-hmm. good for American citizens. I would like to have more choices. I'm a staunch Democrat, but I'd love some choices. Sometimes, you know, I just want, I want, I want to hear something different. I want to hear some new ideas. I need someone to challenge my own thinking Mm -hmm. around what the right way is to do things. So two, three, four, yeah, the more the merrier. It's, 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 I'm going to challenge you on that as, as the Green Party and others begin to get more vocal over the coming months. There is a question that uh, I I must ask you because we've talked about the role of government, the role of private sector, civil societies, even the black church in addressing the issues related to racial inequity and and addressing the black wealth gap. One, uh, One of our attendees has asked the question is, what is the role of the black community itself? Absolutely. Listen, I I believe that we have the responsibility to love our children, to give them the supports that they need, to teach them what we know, but we can't teach them what we don't know, and we can't give them access to things that we don't have access to. I grew up, my parents will be married uh, next month, 59 years, mm-hmm. uh, and they made a decision that we were going to go to good schools, that education was the most important thing. Um, but look, they came out of that background. I'm the first generation of my family to go to college. I'm the first. Nobody else had been before me. And we were, I went to Dartmouth. My sister went to Dartmouth. My next sister went to Syracuse. And my brother went to the University of Chicago and then Georgetown Law School. It was a priority for us. But we were surrounded in a community of church, mm-hmm. of activists who pressed us, pushed us. It was a co- I had a hundred parents. <laughs> right, but everybody was that was do, that was the that way was we neighbor. function in those mm-hmm. days, and I think we owe it to our children to give them those kinds of of supports, encouragement, pushes. Uh, but you know what, my father and mother couldn't get me a bank loan. Right. What they couldn't get me was access to the golf course where you know all the rich white kids went and made deals. Those kind of access points access to capital, access to people that can make a difference in your life are not things that they could do. But Mm -hmm. bringing down the barriers for access Mm -hmm. is something that the federal government can help with. Mm -hmm. Making uh, access more equitable uh, in in, in, uh, educational systems, in uh, uh, the the social clubs is something that private sector can do. Uh, so we have to do our part, yes, but there are only there are other things that the other parts of the of the country have to do as well. Yeah, and when you talk about the opportunities that we had, our generation had, uh, and we see the data that now come that that uh, McKinsey published, as I noted earlier, that seventy percent of children born into the middle class will fall out of the middle class before. Be, because of lack of access to loans, lack of access to capital, lack of access to uh, opportunities for jobs and and other impacts of intergenerational wealth and lack of change in the systems that provide opportunity for a, a for amassing wealth, and so yes, they, I, I I I agree that we that there is responsibility by the parents, but there is also, as you know, responsibility by the the, the private sector, the government, and we will ex- I, we will and and you see this every day accept responsibility for ourselves and our community when those doors are open. Exactly. And so the, the, to anyone else out there who has a question, um, I would ask you to go to CCGA 
um, ccga.live and to type that question in. We have a few more minutes with, with uh, Bishop Lowry. And uh, th th this is a question you may or may not be able to answer. The, 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 but we have a number of people who have signed on to this question. And that is what steps can be taken to build a more diverse foreign service um, and diplomatic corps so that uh, the people representing America abroad are more representative of the American people as a whole? That's an excellent question. And, you know, having worked at OPM for a while and been in administ Clinton administration, um, those kind of barriers don't exist only in the foreign service, mm -hmm. but in the professional rank throughout government because of lack of access, because of lack of training, because of the old boys and girls clubs that excludes people uh, without certain backgrounds who didn't go to the right schools and so forth. What the government can do is, is work and it is work to break those barriers down, to create entry points, training programs, and to be very intentional about saying, we are going to diversify our foreign service ranks. That is our goal and we are going to do it. A lot of this starts at the top. A lot of this starts with leadership laying down the marker. The Secretary of State, the President of the United States, the Secretary of State can say and implement new foreign service training programs hmm. that are intentional about bringing in more women, about bringing in more people of color into the foreign service ranks so that they can rise hmm. and do the job. What mo most of the time, all people need is a chance. Mm. is an open door. They just need the door to be opened and to have access so that they can excel with the skills that they have. That's something that the government can do very quickly, very intentionally. It's say, this is what we are going to do and here is how we are going to do it. I have forgotten about your service in OPM. So of course you had an answer for that question. <laughs> um, in, in 2018, you launched Power Rising. Why? You know, coming off of the 2016 election, it was clear, you know, Hillary Clinton got 90, what, 4% of the African-American female vote. Uh, and everyone was saying, well, Black women did this, Black women, much like they're doing today. And we decided after 2016, I was actually at a retreat of the Congressional Black Caucus women. They invited me to speak. And when it was all over, Congresswoman Maxine Waters said to me, so Leah, what should we be doing now? What should black women do now? I said, well, Matt, Congresswoman, if I could wave my magic wand, <laughs> I say that so often that one of my best friends actually bought me a wand. I would call a conference of black women so we can decide what we're going to do next. Decide how we're going to leverage our power. We are rising in business. We are rising in economic. We are rising in politics. How do we leverage all these power points? And that is how Power Rising was born. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had our first gathering and women came from around the country, 40 different states, came to Atlanta to converge and to talk about business and economic and power, culture and community, education and innovation, health and wellness and political empowerment, and begin to build the networks that will allow them to rise. And the best thing about Power Rising was that these were not women who were known household names. They came from all over and they made connections. They might be sitting next to a college president or a Fortune 500 uh, C-suite person or you know, a student. Women brought their mothers, women brought their daughters and we were intergenerational as we tried to give women the, the push, the encouragement, the inspiration that they needed to go to the next step in their lives. And that all of the stories coming out are women who started businesses, who went back to school, who graduated, who, you know, tried a new career. It's been marvelous. And we have continued to meet every year since then. Even in the pandemic, we meet virtually. We're out of time. And the time went so fast. But give us one last set of words, couple words on what do you think we as Americans uh, and people watching this, this conversation today need to do to work to working together to make America a better country? The most radical 
revolutionary thing that we can do is to be in relationship with other people, real relationship, where you can look into their eyes and know their name and their children's name. It's hard to demonize people when you know their kids' names. Mm -hmm. It's hard mm -hmm. to make an enemy of someone when you know where they live and you, know, you, and you break bread together. And I say that that's radical and revolutionary because we're living in a time now where you can live your whole life from your computer screen. Mm -hmm. Your laundry can come in, your food can be delivered. You never have to see another person. So actually being in conversation with some, seeing them, making it a habit to see people, who they are, what they're doing, what their interests are, and vice versa, leads, I think, to some of the breaking, they sound simple, mm -hmm. but it leads, I think, to some of the breaking down of these barriers that we create around ourselves and between ourselves because we don't see each other. We don't talk to each other. We don't acknowledge each other's humanity. Everything is so inwardly focused these days and the pandemic has made it worse. Mm -hmm. But I think on the heels of pandemic, we so yearn now for relationship mm -hmm. because we can't go out. Those of us who are being safe anyway, we haven't seen our friends. And so I think when this is over and we've all been vaccinated and oh. it, <laughs> Hugs and really having conversations with the guy who slices your meat in the deli. <laughs> those sorts of things, those small interactions help to create and build and strengthen the fiber of the fabric that is America. Bishop Leah D. Daughtry, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation to carry on the, the, the thought leadership beyond the Black History Month. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Please join us for more of these conversations in the future and subscribe to our newsletter and become a part of the CCGA family. Thank you, Bishop Daughtry. I look forward to that being that hug yes. when, we, when we get back together again. Thank you, Thank ladies you so and gentlemen. Much. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.